Life of Smoke and Silvered Glass, a Harry Potter fanfiction written by E.J. Lomax on Archive of Our Own as Dirge Without Music, part 5 of 6, read by Grant Goodwin. In Harry's fourth year of school, the Goblet of Fire chose him as a frankly illegal second Hogwarts champion. But what about sportsmanship, Severus asked Dumbledore dryly. What about the kid not dying before he figures out how to brush his hair? I must figure out who's placed his name in the goblet, said Albus, tearing apart a lemon drop wrapper. Sunlight was pouring through the windows, and Severus put his feet up on Albus's desk. There can have been no reason for it except to endanger him. I bet he thinks it was me, said Severus. The first task was dragons, so Severus lurked down by the dragon handlers, asking about some of the rarer dragon-derived potions ingredients. During the actual task, he sat rigid in the stands, and tried not to think about Harry. Eleven. God, had he ever really been that small? Dangling from his broom while Severus hissed anti-jinxes under his breath. Severus had been seeing Neville once a week since his first year for tutoring. He scowled through it, and sometimes napped at his desk for the safer stretches of brewing, when he knew there was something Neville got. The kid was approaching grade-level standards, though, and had, on at least one instance, corrected Granger on a brewing fact. What's that? Neville asked when Severus put a box of gillyweeds on his desk, while rummaging through his ingredients for some fire flower essence. He scowled and snored and snubbed, but Severus tried to encourage questions, however sourly he answered them. Gillyweed, said Severus. Ingested, it allows a wizard to breathe underwater. But you have an illumination brew to make. Get to it, Longbottom. And then he put his boots up on his desk, and pretended to snore through Neville tentatively robbing his unlocked gillyweed stores. Alistair Moody cornered him out on the grounds. Now he smelled of dark arts, but Severus supposed he'd had plenty of terrible years to get the stuff on him. Like glitter, it never really came off. Severus was glad to have him, though, because when whatever Voldemort flunky was lurking raised his ugly head, he could trust all Mad-Eye to kill him dead without a flinch. Small comforts. Course Dumbledore trusts you, Moody said. He's a trusting man, isn't he? Believes in second chances, he said, and Severus almost laughed because people kept telling him these false things about Dumbledore. Instead, he raised both eyebrows in one side of his mouth, and waited. But me, said Moody, I say there are spots that don't come off, Snape. Spots that never come off, do you know what I mean? Always nice to see you too, Alistair, said Severus, but I'd like to get back to my walk. Karkaroff cornered him too, down in his dungeons, his hand wrapped tight around the inside of his opposite forearm. Karkaroff, long time, said Severus so I see they put you in charge of children. How odd. You're one to talk, Snape. Karkarov's hand around his forearm was white-knuckled, pressing into marked flesh. Severus knew the feeling. His dark mark had been prickling and darkening all year, but he had had Quirrell haunting his classrooms, had seen Dumbledore locking a destroyed diary away, had been waiting for this. Hold yourself together, Karkarov, he said, and swept off to grade some papers. The cup was supposed to make some sort of signal when a champion reached it, but nothing happened. The spectator views of the third task were poorly thought out, but while the crowd wandered and peered at the high hedges, Severus felt the mark on his forearm burst into blinding life. It cut into his skin like he was getting it all over again, arm outstretched, Voldemort's cold fingers around his wrist, a tip of his wand dragging along the skin. By the time Severus got to Albus and the crowd of spectators, Harry was back. He was on his knees in the grass, both hands clenched in the robes of a dead boy. Cedric had been terrible at neat dicing in Severus's class, but wonderful at lending his supplies to those around him who'd forgotten to bring what they needed. Everything was noise. The pain in his forearm was dragging at his attention. Amos Diggory was on his knees, in the grass. Moody, no, crouched the younger. What had Bella called him? Barty Jr., crouched the crotchety? took Harry, and Albus realised his mistake in time. Severus and Minerva flanked him, and Severus dug up Veritaserum from his stores when asked. His forearm was aching, the skin, yes, but it felt like the pain was cutting down through the tissue and sinew to bone. He's back, Harry was saying. He's back. His hair was in his eyes and his hands were shaking, and he looked like no one except a scared fifteen-year-old boy with grass stains on his knees. When Severus and Lily had been children, they had come home from summer afternoons covered in grass stains, and Mrs. Evans had put Severus's things through the wash before she sent him home. Don't want your mum to fuss, she'd said, hands hesitating over Severus's bony shoulders, without touching him. Albus pulled Severus to the side, 
slow and quiet. Go, he said. You know what you need to do. Severus wrapped his hand around his opposite forearm, holding so tight his knuckles turned white with it. He knew where he was meant to be, and he could feel Voldemort's impatience pacing up his spine. Severus grabbed nothing, just paced out of the room and out of the castle and out of the grounds, past the main gates and the anti-apparition charms. He vanished with a violent thud of air and appeared in a poorly lit room somewhere below London. They'd left the graveyard, but here was the tall, pale ghost of an angry young man. Here was the feeling of gentle fingers whispering over the inside of Severus's skull. The men arrayed around Voldemort wore their masks and hoods, except for Pettigrew cringing in the corner. But Severus stood bareheaded in his professor's robes. He inhaled the musty air of the room. My lord, said Severus, and dropped to his knees. Severus slunk back into the school the next day. He had to keep his cover, he'd told Voldemort. Yes, here, he'd said. Take a walk through fifteen years of Albus's exhausted shoulders. It's all yours. This was for you. All for you, lord. A headache was dragging along his temples like cold fingers, the tip of a wand. Hogwarts felt nearly empty, its corridors echoing, its classrooms shut. Severus moved over stone and past armour and painted canvas, until he found them. The whole student body, the faculty, the staff, in the great hall. Albus stood at the head of the podium, and Severus could see the weight on his shoulders. There will come a time, Albus said, when you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy, he said. And Severus turned and walked away, back down the empty hall. Dumbledore's voice followed him. Remember, Cedric Diggory. Severus went down to his room and sat on his bedspread behind the closed door. He put the tip of his wand to his temple and pulled out wispy white strands full of musty air and low voices. Pulled them out of him and bottled the memories away for Elbus's old, tired hands. Severus could have run for the edges of the grounds the moment he felt the marks scream into full life. He could have run far enough to apparate to the graveyard and maybe Cedric would still have been alive. Maybe he could have done something, burned his covers, saved a child. He thought about a house in flames, wallpaper, yellow and white lace curtains. Harry never told the full story of the graveyard, and Severus never knew that Cedric had been long dead before the mark ever activated. He laid on his bed and searched his ceiling for mould, and wondered about what price was too high to pay. You checked, didn't you, Elbus? said Severus. Mad-Eye Moody glared at him from just inside the door of Grimold Place, and Severus said, Hey, little Barty got the glares down pat. That's doing you no favours. Dumbledore sighed. I'm sure, Severus. Mmm, said Severus, and slunk inside past Moody. He followed a step in Dumbledore's wake, so any concerned, questioning, accusing looks could glance first off the old man's knowing smile, and their protests could die in their throats. The front hall loomed, and the big table outside the kitchen was still half drowned in dark, despite even Molly Weasley's best attempts to light it. Voices were muffled in the corners of heavy wood. Bread and lamps and briskly scrubbed floors did their best, but something in the room resisted. Severus gave Molly's food a wide radius, and sat at the furthest corner of the table, ignoring Black's glare and Lupin's considering gaze. He wanted neither of them. A woman's voice catawalled down the stair, thumping on the expletives, shrieking on the verbs. Shacklebolt was looking concerned at the sound. Black said with a groan, My mother's portrait was put up with some damned powerful sticking charms. She's not going till the house burns down. The shriek rose to a crescendo. Maybe burn it down, said Severus, and Black swivelled to look at him. Should Snivellus really be here? said Black. I trust him, said Dumbledore, and Severus raised two eyebrows on one side of his mouth until Black twisted up his face and looked away. Tonks entered the room via a tumbled coat rack and a knocked-over chair, and then the first meetings of the Second Order of the Phoenix began. Severus didn't ask Tonks if she'd kept up with her brewing, and she didn't look his way. They didn't tell Harry about the steps they were taking, or the measures they were making. Harry didn't write his least favourite potions professor, but Severus heard from Dumbledore that the kid was reaching and asking, desperate and angry. He'd been born into a war once. People had been pretending it had been over for years. But Severus knew better. Albus knew better. And now Harry did too. Severus went to order meetings in Grimold Place, the location safe in Dumbledore's secret-keeping hands. Safe. He went back to Lucius's third best parlour. New carpet. Old chasers. To Avery's cramped little kitchen. 
a rotating cast of basements and back rooms. He bottled up white wisps of memory for Dumbledore, and he let Voldemort walk around his mind. The summer passed. Severus only got a glimpse of Harry in Grimold Place, twitchy and scowling, but he liked the way Granger and Weasley looked at him with their hearts in their anxious throats. Severus had never seen McGonagall so angry about anything as about Dolores Umbridge, and he had been the recipient of her glares more than once in his three decades of life. It confused him that she could be as angry about this toad of a woman as she was about the maybe Death Eater in her midst, but he supposed she'd been able to fight Voldemort when it came down to it, and there wasn't much she could do about Umbridge. Minerva broke a mug in the staff room when once she was gone, long gone, no witnesses, Severus cleaned it up. The day Umbridge sat in on Severus's potions class was the smuggest he'd ever seen Harry in company, and Severus stood stiffly at the front of the room, trying to think of nothing but Newt's eyes and pewter. Not James with curses and grins, not James in a green knit cap, not Black's thirteen years, not Pettigrew cowering but breathing in the back of Voldemort's meetings. He didn't let Umbridge sit in on Neville's tutoring, or on Goyle's, who was trying and who could follow the instructions, if you sat still and explained them patiently enough, and let him fiddle with the knives. Sue Lee was a Ravenclaw, who had hunted him down at twelve to demand extracurricular potions. He let Umbridge hover while he quizzed Lee on the liminal tendencies of red spot toadstools. Lee blasted him with clarifying queries and suppositions that led them all the way down the track to the philosophical gestalt inherent in brewing, and Umbridge slunk out of the dungeons looking frankly dizzy. Tom Riddle was slinking around Harry's mind, Albus said. They had a connection, Albus said, and Severus stared out the windows, over the headmaster's shoulder. Harry needed someone to train him in occlumency, Albus said, and Severus tried. He scowled through it, because that's how this went, and Harry scowled on back. The boy's mind was brittle and wide open, grasping and desperate for answers no one was giving him. Severus tried to pretend he had too many ugly answers heavy on his shoulders to have any sympathy for him. I cannot do this, said Severus, a bare few weeks into the lessons. He's a nosy, irresponsible little brat, and I can't do this. I can't be there. I can't be dragging this shit up. Do you think I'm not doing enough lying, Elbus? Dumbledore frowned at him over steepled fingers, all warm concern, and Severus scowled back. Elbus said, I thought you would enjoy the chance to connect with him. He shouldn't be connecting with a goddamn Death Eater, and that's what I am. You are the best Oclemens I've ever known, including myself, said Elbus. That's too bad. Find someone else. Harry had dug into Severus's pensive, and found a sunny afternoon that flooded even Harry goddamn Potter with pity. Severus's knees in the grass, bile in his throat, James laughing and Lily not. Severus had felt small, bug-like, a chitinous shell growing over all his softest parts. He couldn't remember these days, living without that exoskeleton over his skin, and he didn't mind so much any more. He climbed back down to his office and straightened up the innards of his pensive, sorted the spools of memory with the softest grip he could manage. What Harry had found was not Severus's worst memory. That was not when he had lost her. Umbridge outlawed everything she could get her hands on, and Severus watched. Granger founded a resistance group in the back rooms of her schoolhouse, and Severus watched. Albus was ousted from his own office, and Severus watched. He gave Umbridge fake veritaserum when asked, and he slept as well as he ever had. Severus saw them in halls, grouped around their smallest members, in the detentions writing out lies with firm strokes of their quills. Fred Weasley reminded him of James, sitting beside a frightened first year, and waiting for him to find his words. Harry's shoulders were going rigid like he was growing a shell over all the soft parts of himself, something steady and shining, like the suits of armour that lined the corridors. He stood up in classes and hallways and common rooms, and told his truth again and again. Severus was something like jealous. He was something like proud. He didn't talk to Lily, even alone in his rooms late at night, even when Harry was standing in Umbridge's line of fire, refusing to be bowed. He didn't think, Lily, look. Late in the spring, Harry had a nightmare. His mind was brittle and desperate, grasping for anything, given nothing. And so old Tom slipped fear and knowing into his sleeping mind. Severus didn't know all of this until later, until he was talking to Albus, subdued in his office among broken odds and ends. Harry was in Umbridge's office at one point. Even in the worst of Severus's first war, 
Hogwarts, at least, had never been a battlefield. Severus had almost died in a tunnel under a willow, perhaps, but that had been pettiness in children, and an inability to see consequences. But here was a woman standing, shaking and pointing. Here was Draco Malfoy with a badge on his chest, and a smirk he thought he meant. Snuffles, said Harry. He has snuffles in the place where it's hidden, he said. Severus could see Granger churning through courses of action, like a woman behind enemy lines. He could see the desperation that was living behind Harry's snakeskin eyes. The littlest Weasley had a bruised cheek and a stubborn visage, and Severus wondered if Sprout had ever taken her out to the greenhouses. He told Umbridge he was out of Veritas' room, and that Potter was speaking nonsense, and then he went to call the rest of the order to arms. They met in Grimold Place, every person he could find, Kingsley and Moody, Tonks and Lupin. They came and he tried not to be surprised. Molly fussed and fretted, and Arthur was still too pale, but they came and they listened and they went. It was almost nostalgia, hearing the bang and crack of people going off to fight without him. The mark on his arm spiked into painful life, but he knew he wasn't expected by either side. In the Department of Mysteries, six Hogwarts students clashed with grown, hooded fighters. In a room haunted by a veiled archway, reinforcements came for them. Sirius Black died at Bella's eager hand. Voldemort flooded into all the empty places in Harry's chest, sending him writhing over the atrium floor, and Severus sat in the dark of Grimald Place and listened to Black's mother shriek. Severus apparated back to Hogwarts's outer gates when they told him it was over, and strode back to the castle with his cloak flapping behind him. At Hogwarts, you were always a step away. At Hogwarts, you had to rush to its boundaries before you could vanish to anywhere useful. He climbed up to Elvis's office, where his trinkets and toys and treasures had been smashed here and there by Harry's fifteen-year-old grief. Fifteen. Had Severus ever been that small? He had held Lily's hand at that age, sat through the muggy heat of her father's funeral, and bought her a candy bar after. Albus was reinstated and Umbridge had gone missing. Severus gave a lesson about Bezuers and watched Harry scowl and clench his hands in the back row. Severus wasn't sure how Harry thought the Order had gotten the news, if not for Severus. He didn't corner the boy and snap that he hadn't abandoned him in Umbridge's office. He'd passed on the message, as asked, what did he want? Sometimes you had to say one thing and do another. But maybe Harry did know. If Severus hadn't alerted the Order, Black wouldn't have gone to the Ministry, and Black wouldn't be dead. Harry might be then, but Black wouldn't. Severus watched the boy stalk through the halls, fifteen years old with his shoulders hunched up to his ears, and he could understand that. He had been that small before. That summer, Dumbledore found the gaunt ring and murdered the snippet of spirit living inside it. Hogwarts was empty over the summer holidays, except for Hagrid out weeding the grounds. Severus met Albus up in his high study, and turned his blackening hand over in his sallow fingers. This is an ugly curse, he said, like he'd comment on the warm weather burning the grass outside. Did you expect any less of Tom? Albus said. You apparently didn't, Severus snapped, laying Albus's hand gently back on the table. There are some things you cannot defend against, said Albus. I made a call. Severus rose to pace, a hiss held tight behind his teeth. Dark times are coming, said Albus. Obviously, Severus snapped. Did you hear the news I brought? He's recruiting the giants. He's got Fenrir out after the werewolves. Albus wasn't looking at him. Albus, what do you know? What have you heard that I don't know? Narcissa Malfoy may soon ask you a favour, Albus said, looking at his hand. Albus, tell me. I have more sources than just you, Severus. It is just... She may ask you a favour. Please say yes. Severus's parents had died, and he had buried them in shallow earth so the house in Spinner's End was his now. Narcissa had never been there before, and he was trying to decide if he appreciated the way she looked at him, and not at the water stains or the battered pans or the threadbare carpet. Bellatrix came in after her, and dropped down on a sunken couch, soft cushions curling around her hips. He's asked Draco to, Narcissa said, voice catching, and Bella said, Yes, it's an honour, and Severus went to pour himself a glass of water. He didn't offer either of them any. Narcissa didn't ask him for the Dark Lord. She asked him for her own sake. Severus wondered if it was because she knew something. She took his hands and squeezed them like they were still teenagers, like he was in love with Lily Evans, and Sissa was soberly considering the curve of Lucius's adolescent jawline. 
My son, Narcissa said. Whatever he needs to do, you must promise to help him. Bella demanded the unbreakable vow, because she didn't understand any of him. The Narcissa's dry hands gripping his were all that was needed to bind him here. That Severus would break any promises he needed, no matter if his blood boiled in his veins from the lie. How would you like to fill the defense against the Dark Arts position this year, Severus? Severus stared at Albus. Within the year, then, you think? said Severus. You think this will all come crashing down within the year? If you are willing to hand me over to that curse, now. Dumbledore's withered, ashy hand sat on the desk between them. He had kept the gaunt ring on his finger, the morbid soul. I do not think I will survive the year, and when you kill me, you will no longer be welcome at Hogwarts. What if I don't want to kill you, Elvis? I promise to help Draco, not... When has this ever been about wanting for you? Dumbledore shook his head. Had he always been this old, Severus wondered? Had he always been this small, narrow-shouldered, beneath generations of portraits of dead wizards and witches? Elbus said, I will tell Harry about the Horcruxes, this year. Draco will try to kill me, and we cannot let him, Severus. Killing scars the soul. He's too young to carry that. We cannot let him. Too young. Had they ever been that young? What about my soul, Severus said? Or did I not make it into your calculations, headmaster? It won't be a killing from your hands, said Elbus, and Severus scoffed and stalked toward the windows. You know more than he does. From you, it will be a mercy. Not for me, said Severus. For me, said Elbus. Please, Severus. Do you know what I have done for this fight? Severus had screamed at Elbus once, but he didn't say it now. For them? For you? Do you understand what I have bled and what I have cut away? All right, said Severus, when it's time. Make sure you say your goodbyes this year, Albus. To who, said Albus, and Severus dropped his head down and laughed. Draco slunk around corners that year, looking pale and heavy-eyed. He looked worse than Harry, which was fairly saying something. Harry slunk around behind him, still desperate, still grasping, and Severus remembered trying so badly to dig out Lupin's secrets at sixteen. He cornered Draco when he could offered help, pretended to know secrets he didn't, threatened, anything to get anything at all off the boy's shoulders, but Draco stood and shook and refused. Severus and Lily had written in the pages of his textbooks, on their bellies in her bedroom, leaning over them at Hogwarts library tables. He'd filled his potion textbook with irritated corrections to imperfect recipes, and she'd drawn little comics of their classmates. James messing with his hair so much it all fell out. Lucius leaving a trail of sleaze behind him, Alice standing on the Hufflepuff table in the Great Hall and shouting about non-human rights. Severus had invented things out in the forest, ripped magic from his chest and considered what he found there. So little of it had been kind. Severus heard noises from a bathroom, years after he had written those things down, lifetimes after, and he found Narcissus' son bleeding out on the grungy tile from a spell he'd invented at sixteen. I didn't, said Harry. I didn't mean... I didn't realise. Everyone always said Harry looked like his father, and Severus had known James petty and young, ugly and hurtful. He had known him quiet in a dusty attic, waiting for Severus to find all his words. Draco's blood was on the bathroom tile, and Severus would clean it up later, when he was done with the kid's wounds, and giving Harry Saturday detentions until the end of the year. Everyone always said Harry looked like James, but Harry was standing over a bleeding classmate, and all Severus saw in that moment was Tom. Albus told him later that Harry had been angry, that he had been frightened, that he had thought Draco had been up to something, that he hadn't known what the Sectum Semper spell did. Severus wasn't sure that made anything better. He went out to the forest and turned tree trunks bloody, like he was sixteen and curious with it again. He thought about Levi Corpus on James's tongue, all the things Severus had dragged out of his own chest, and then found in other people's careless hands. There were Death Eaters on Hogwarts ground that year, more than the back of Quirrell's skull, or Riddle's diary, or a rat curled up high in Gryffindor Tower, more than Lucius Malfoy come to give his son a present, or Barty Crouch Jr. hiding in other people's skin. Draco made them a gate, and they came, in pairs, in robes, wands drawn, smiling under their hoods. Please, said Elbus, standing in the astronomy tower among enemies, and Draco, and Severus, and how did Severus get to a point in his life where Elbus Dumbledore was the only person alive who knew anything at all about who he was?
Please, Severus, he said. And how was this real? That Albus Dumbledore was going to die begging. Draco was shaking, his wand arm no longer even lifted, and Severus wanted to scream at him. About Narcissa's dry hands, how in school Severus had been so certain she was going to go somewhere, conquer things, shine. About being eighteen in a burning, bloodless home, deciding then and there what to do the day someone alive was at the end of his wand. Severus wanted to scream at him. If you were stronger, I wouldn't have to do this. But Draco was a child, and Severus hadn't been one of those in a long time. Draco couldn't do it. Not for his mother, and not for himself. He couldn't even raise his wand, and Severus was something like jealous. He was something like proud. Please, said Albus, and Severus found enough hatred in his soul to kill him. It might have been a mercy to Albus. It might have been a rescue for Draco, and a boon for Narcissa. But Severus watched the light go out of Albus's eyes. He heard Harry scream from below the floorboards, and he had heard that scream from smaller lungs. The wind billowed through the astronomy tower's high window, and Albus Dumbledore hit the ground somewhere far below. You'd better run, Severus told Draco. His voice didn't even shake, because he asked it not to. Hogwarts rose against the invaders, and Severus blocked their curses and thought, Good. Ginny Weasley hurled bat bogey hexes at Avery, and Susan Bones ducked under Bella's avida cadavera, and Neville Longbottom charged at Rodolphus with his wand in his thick fist, and Severus thought, Were we ever that young? Dumbledore's body was going cold on the flagstones. Severus was so tired of running for the edges of Hogwarts. He was so tired of not being where he needed to be. He was so tired of people screaming at him. He was so tired. And here was James's son. Here was Lily's son charging down the grass after him. Harry was screaming about cowardice because he didn't know how to scream about how he had lost too many fathers lately. He had Lily's eyes. He had James's stupid fucking hair. And Severus was tired. Death Eaters were disappearing all around him with a crack and a boom. The castle was alight behind Harry and his furious stupefies. Elbus was dead at Severus's hand. He had begged for it in the end, for the sake of a scared boy's soul, and Severus could not name it a mercy. Don't call me a coward, said Severus. He took a step backward over the Hogwarts property line, and vanished. He would have liked a day. He would have liked to ask Sprout to feed Agatha. He would have liked to find a corner where no one could bother him, and sit there until he fell asleep. But instead, Severus appeared with a crack in the foyer of Malfoy Manor. Voldemort rose up with whispering robes, with a smile, and a guinea curled around his ankles. Soft fingers pressed against Severus's skull, and he filled his mind with hate. End of part five of six. This has been a reading of a fanfiction creation by E. Jade Lomax, with music by Maiden. 